Well, good morning, Freedom Church. Good morning, Freedom Church. So turn in your Bibles to Ruth chapter 4. And if you're there, say, Pastor, I'm there. And it says this, and we're going to read through this because I want, if you've been here for the last six weeks, you can at least go home and say, I've read an entire book of the Bible. Ruth is one of the shortest, and in chapter 4, verse 1, this is the, the closing of this whole book. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there, just as the Goel, or guardian, or kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along. And Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. And if you remember from last week, there was one person in line before Boaz that could redeem Ruth and Naomi and the family, and so that's what this scenario is about. And it says, Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. And then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. And if you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, no, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. And this brother says, I will go ahead and redeem it, Boaz. And Boaz says, well, okay, that's fine, but on the day you buy the land, you also acquire some mouths to feed. Ruth the Moabite, you remember, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, oh. whoa. I didn't know that was a part of the deal. I can't redeem that because that might endanger my own estate and my own, you know, will that I've written. You go ahead and redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. My, I can't do it because that's too much of a sacrifice, right? Now, in earlier times for Israel, the redemption and transfer of property became final, and one party took off his sandal, gave it to the other. That was the method of legalizing transactions. And so the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. He removes his sandal. Boaz announced to the elders, today your witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property. Limelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also required Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife, and in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you all are witnesses of this. And then the elders and all the people at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathath and be famous in Bethlehem, though the offspring spring of the Lord gives you by this young woman. May your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. And Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive. Who enabled her to conceive? And she gave birth to a son, and the woman said to Naomi, praise to be to the Lord. Who is he? To? The women said to Naomi, now we're going back to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who's better to you than seven sons has given him birth. And Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. And the woman living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Father, we bless you today, and we thank you, God, that we can place our faith in a God who sees beyond our present situation. We thank you, God, that you're the type of God that uses our circumstances and our situations for your kingdom to be advanced in the earth. We thank you, God, that our ways are not your ways, that your ways are higher than ours, your thoughts are higher than ours, and I pray, God, over this place that you would eradicate all of our homes from worry because we have such a good, great faith and a good, good Father. We bless you today. Holy Spirit, speak to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You all can have a seat in the presence of the Lord. Well, I got to jump into this because I have much to say, but right away... When you read this chapter, you are caught up in the suspense of this chapter. And Ruth, if how many people were here last week? You will remember the epic marriage proposal that happened on the threshing floor when she proposes to Boaz, place your wings upon me. 
and, and if you want more in terms of what the wings and the corner of the garment is, please listen to last week because I went in way off a tangent talking about Christ and his wings. So if you're interested in that, please listen from last week. But right away, we're drawn into this relationship built on self-sacrifice. And when we're reading it, we want Ruth and Boaz to fall in love and go and live their life. That's where we want, you know, this is a great, this is beautiful. We want them to go ahead, but there's another Goel, there's another Redeemer that's in the way. And no matter, the first thing we know from this text is that no matter, there's good news in this, no matter what happens, Ruth and Naomi are going to be okay. Because whether it's Boaz or this other kinsman redeemer, God has already got it worked out. But here's the bad news for us that are following along. We like Boaz. And we want Boaz to get Ruth. We want this relationship to work out. And the would-be redeemer says, I'll take Elimelech's land. This deal sounds great for me. And then Boaz says, ah, 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 ah. You can have it all, but you also got to take, you know, the widow, Moabite. Yeah, you got to add that. There's going to be, I could imagine Boaz, you know, you know, it's only three more mouths to feed and it's a good deal. But here's the deal, Boaz. You know, if you, you have to have a kid with Ruth, and when you have that kid, that kid has rights to all of the inheritance of the family, even above your own kids, because that's what a redeemer would do. I mean, if you want to take, go ahead and take Ruth. She's beautiful, but this is going to cost you something. Look at someone and say, it's going to cost you something. And Boaz Church, he is willing to sacrifice in order to redeem Ruth. He's willing to make a sacrifice. Now, I've talked about the typology of Boaz and Jesus already, but at least we have this idea of a redeemer that is willing to redeem someone, even if it costs them quite a bit. That, to me, sounds like someone I know. I don't know about you, but my redeemer decided to redeem me and it wasn't a cheap grace. It wasn't something that he just flippantly did. I'm going to go ahead and save Sandra and Claire and Lawrence. And I'm just going to go ahead and save Ingrid. This is nothing. He said, no, this is going to cost me something. But because of this deep love, I'm going to pour out not the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of, my, of the Savior of the universe. Look at someone and say, it wasn't cheap grace. And this cost Boaz something. But that's not the only issue that we see right out the gate. There is another issue and a bigger issue that the author is drawing our attention to as well. And in your Bible and in my Bible, right after that last stanza of verses, what does your Bible say as a caption? It's the genealogy of who? Who? Why are you telling us about David? We're talking about Ruth and Boaz and a marriage. We're talking about a wedding. Why are you telling us right out the gate that this is the genealogy of David? And you have to say, why is this important? Because here we're watching this story of God's faithfulness to Naomi and Ruth, but we see something bigger, that while God is faithful to these individuals, he's also being faithful to a nation. Both are happening at the same time, and he's paving a way for Israel to have the king that they need. Now, all right, I I need someone. Y'all got to wake up here because I need you to catch this. Are you awake? I know some of you all were partying last night at the praise dance concert. You're a little bit tired today, but I need you to wake up and catch this because in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, it lets us know that this is in the time of the judges. We are given a genealogy of David in the time of the judges. Why are you talking to us about kings in the period of the judges? Israel has not even asked for a king yet. Saul is not even alive yet. This is 150 years before David, and we're talking about this wicked king that will rise up and rebel against God, and God is letting us know that he's raising up a man after his own heart. 
that was a good place to shout, young lady. Because if you're taking notes, the first point you must write down and leave here with and know inside your belly is that God is always 10 steps ahead of you. Faith, look, Hebrews chapter 11 is a, Hebrews is a progressive revelation of faith. Faith is all throughout the Bible, and I'm going to give you some steps for faith. One step of faith is this, knowing that God is always 10 moves ahead of you. And that his thoughts are not your thoughts. His ways are not your ways. They're not. They are higher. God is always 10 moves ahead of you. And I might be, that might be sort of a conservative estimate. See, my son Xavier had a birthday on September 6th, same day as me. And, And he got in total from every single random dollar the church folk gave him, and I, it's my birthday, and you know, here's a dollar. He got $86 for his birthday. This joker is, what's he now, seven? He just turned seven. So last year, Joanna took him to Target. He got his money, he goes to Target, and he just bought as much crap as he could find. A Moana doll, this crap. That, I'm sorry, can I, can I, I'm going to get in trouble for that word. He just bought a bunch of random stuff no one would ever use because he had all this money. So all year, he had to live with the reality of, I could have bought an Xbox game that I could still be playing now, but rather I bought all this junk. So this year, he takes all of his money and he places it in a little canister. He still has it. He hasn't spent any of it. And then we were playing this matching game. I play this game with my kid. You know, you flip a card, they flip a card. You get a match, you get one point, and you hold your matches until the end, and you count it. And he was feeling himself earlier this week. It might have been Sunday night or Monday night. And he comes to me, and he goes, Dad, I want to play you for money. (laughs) So I'm like, okay. Things are tight in the household. I might as well abuse this young man. So be a nice dinner out, $86. I can use that. So he goes, $2. I'm like, two? Why don't we just do five? He's like, five, five. You know, he's so confident. Walks into the room, set the cards up, set the game up. And the first round, I beat him, $5. I said, and he goes, you know, he had that look like, I'm not going to. You know, we were just, you're my dad. We're just kid. <laughs> it was just a joke, right? And I'm like, no, sir, I'll be waiting. So he goes to his canister, gets his $5, gives it to me. So that ends that night. So then the following night, he goes, Dad, I need to get my five back. I said, sure, let's, let's roll the dice. And so he rolls up with a 20 this time. <laughs> like, I got my 20, I'm going to, I said, okay, 20 it is. Stung him, I got him again. At this point, I'm like, me and Joanna about to go eat for real. But this time, when he brings the $20 back to me, he's like starting to tear up. You know, the look. And he gives me the 20, but it, and I said, man, we don't, you put your name, you said 20. Don't cry, come over here crying about your $20 that you lost. You said 20. He goes, fine, another 20. And Bella is like, Xavier, what are you doing? I said, it's another 20. Get your, and I get him again. This joker is $45 in the hole. His whole life is crumbling. And, and I don't know if he just had a moment of stupidity or you know how people gamble it. I know none of y'all gamble, but he was just like, I'm going to go all in. You know, one of them moments. So he puts another $20 on the table. But he beat me. You guys are so sad. Cheering him on with his gambling struggles. Then he doubles down another 20, Dad. And he beat me again. Now, I want you all to know that I was trying to win because I wanted to get all of his money and teach him this lesson on gambling. But then I found that my lesson isn't working out right. 
Because at this point, after he won the 220s back, he's dancing, he's moving, he's shaking. He's like, now we're going for the five. And, you know, a young kid, they're, they're just so bald. But you're just weird when they're talking. He just was like, we're going for another five. I said, are you dabbing on me? Which you, you dabbing on me? And then, boom, the third round in a row, he beat me again. So he got all his money back, and I realized that this analogy is going bad. It's not working out, because now he's like, I might be the best gambler in the world. This might be my calling. So I did what any good father would do. I said, I let you win those three games. Now don't go gambling your money off anymore. And I said, you want to play again? He said, nope, I'm good. <laughs> see, for Xavier, all he could see was, was his $86 and his birthday money and all this stuff he had saved. That was his world. That was his everything. All he could see was the now and the present and what was happening. And the very same thought you had, I had, because I wasn't thinking about Xavier and his $86. I was thinking about my son when he's 25 or when he's 35 and he has a family. I don't want this joker going to the casino and spending his money. So I wanted to teach him a lesson that was small in the grand scheme of things, even though it meant so much to him, I was actually thinking about him and my grandkids. See, if you are a really good parent, you are one step ahead of your child. You care about their welfare. You care about who they are. If you are two steps ahead of your child, you are one of the most outstanding. You might be in the top 1% of all parents. See, because one step ahead says, I'm going to make sure your life is cared for. But there are some parents that go two steps ahead, and they say, I'm going to make sure not only my kids, but my grandkids are cared for. But there are very few individuals that have the foresight and the understanding to think about their great great, great grandchildren. But see, the God we serve isn't just a one-step, one-generation God. He's not a two-step, two-generation God. He's not a three-step, three, -step, three we, we serve a God that is at least 10 generations past you. Woo! My great-grandfather was a pastor. He probably lived in the I don't know, the 1800s or something, you know, and, and, and probably dealt with slavery and racism. And maybe there was a moment in his life where he said, God, I want you to eradicate this. And then he had a son named Craig Dillman, who happened to be my grandfather, who ended up being a Methodist pastor. And maybe he prayed that prayer back in 1890, God, that you would help eradicate this racism. And then my grandfather was sitting back and said, oh my God, did my white dog to marry a black man and then all of a sudden we don't understand it but then through their offspring some of their kids would love Jesus and here I am standing as a white and a black man who pastored a Latino church and grew up in a white church and planted a black church I don't know how it works out and that's how where my mind goes but even though my parents were probably only thinking about the Jim Crow laws and where they were at and how this would look, they weren't thinking about what God was doing generationally. And I might have an idea, but how do I know that God didn't bring this wonderful Puerto Rican into my life so that my kids can stand up and talk about being black and white and Latino and be a voice to the... I don't know. See, we just don't know. See, that is why you have to understand and look beyond your perspective to the plans of God. Because you will never make sense of your current situation without looking into the plans of God. You will never be, 
write this down. You will never be able to make sense of your current situation if you don't understand the plans of God. Because if you knew God's plans, you would never worry again. I just was winging it. I don't know what I just said. I'm in the spirit. Thank you. I like you. I don't even, I'm just looking back. Tell us your name. What is it? Bianca, please, please stop us again if you notice that people haven't caught it. If you knew the plans of God, you would never worry again. If you knew that God was going to bring Bianca to this service to stop us right now, to make sure every single person got it in their spirit and in their being. Bianca, if you had known that, you would have woke up today with some pep in your step and somebody's leaving here not worrying because of Bianca. Write that in your notes. Bianca said, do not worry. See, Ruth and Naomi can only see the struggle that they are in. And Ruth is like, hey, I got a man. Oh, God did it. But God is sitting back saying, yeah, and I also got a man. Because there will come a day 150 years from now where this ridiculous nation that I just chose to make my bride will one day come and reject me and say, God, we don't want this theocracy. We want a monarchy like all the other nations around us. Give us a king, God. We don't want you as God. And the first person they pick is going to fall off. But get this, Ruth, Naomi, through your offspring, I'm raising up a man of my own who's after my heart. Because your son, Obed, will have a son named Jesse, and Jesse will have a bunch of sons, but one of the raggedy ones named David is after my heart. Mm. See, God is always working behind the scene in our lives. Always. So the Bible says, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Now, most of the time throughout this book, we hear about a struggle, but rarely do we hear about God doing things. That it's just not good for the text. But in this moment, the Bible wants us to know that, that even the birth of this child, this basic thing, that they were making love, they probably think, well, here's what we've done, but the Bible reminds us God did this. God, God did this. Your child, God did it. Your grandchild, God did it. It's reminding us this because the Bible understands, that, like Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, we build it in vain. Unless God guards the city, the watchmen watch in vain. The Bible, faith is understanding that God is behind all of our efforts. He's the one working it out. If you want to write this down, you can write this, that, that God did it. That's so deep. Name something that happened this week. Caleb, what happened this week? Did you start your car today? You woke up. God did it. Marcus, what, what happened this week? Anything? Did you go to work? Made it to work. Guess what? Bill, did you have a birthday this week? 81. Let's give it up for Bill. I don't know about you, but he's buying the coffees at McDonald's from here on out. Bill, you had a birthday yesterday, right? God did it. AJ, the Cubs lost last night. <laughs> Joey, get, Joey, I realize you both came here today because you said, Lord, is it me? I for, forgive me from my sins. Let the Cubs bring it back tonight. But either way, AJ, God is behind all human effort. 
Not only is he behind it, he's working it out 10 generations beyond you. Mm. Faith is realizing that every single thing in our life is a gift from God. God did it. It's a divine blessing. God enabled her to conceive. Everything is a gift. If we ever understood that, we would never be so caught up in things he takes away. Because you know he's still a good, good father. It's who you are. You know, you think about the things that he took from you. And then what he brought back. Oh, come on. See, Martin Luther, in his small catechism, when he was talking of creation, he says this, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And then he asks this question, what does that mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul and eyes and ears and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have, and he richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and this life. You know, one, one author pointed out there are a lot of articles of faith and doctrine, but this is one of the few where the writer Martin Luther says, I want to thank God for my shoes. When was the last time you thanked God for your shoes? He is in the details. Everything, church, is a gift from God. Your health, your life, your car, your friend, God is in all of the details of your life. And the women said in verse 14 to Naomi, praise the Lord because he has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, and she's better to you than seven sons and has given birth. And she took the baby in her arms, this little Obed, and Naomi, they're like, Naomi has a son. He has a son. You know, this section tells us something, that Naomi has a redeemer. And they're talking in chapter, in verse 14 through 17, they're not talking about Boaz. They're talking about her son, Obed. This boy is going to sustain you, the Bible said, and, and your daughter is better to you than seven sons. And, and you, when you're reading this, you have to take a step back and look at the pattern of the book of Ruth. Because we have a book that is trying to show us what God is trying to get us to see. And in chapter, every single chapter turns the view back on Naomi. Every single chapter turns back and forces us to look at Naomi. Chapter 1, her husband died. Both of her sons died. And the Bible comes back to Naomi. She says, I am bitter in spirit. Call me Mara. Don't call me Naomi because the Lord has stricken me. I am bitter. In chapter 2, you have them out there gleaning in the field. And Ruth comes back with her barley. And the focus is on Naomi again. And God has shown favor. You brought this wheat back and the barley back. And God has shown favor. And Naomi said, God has not forsaken us. Remember that in chapter 2? And in chapter 3, you have this intense scene on the threshing floor where Ruth goes into the, the room with Boaz and says, cover me. But then it comes back to Naomi, and Ruth comes back and says, I've been shown favor. And Naomi is like, oh, thank God for what he's done. And then in chapter 4, you have this courtroom scene, but it comes back again to Naomi. Why are we still talking about Naomi. I want to move on because Ruth and Boaz, we have a wedding celebration. We have a child, Obed. Why do you keep coming back to this old mama? You know, it's like going to, you know, uh, uh, Ryan and Taylor's wedding. And the whole time I get up there and I say, hey, guys, I'm so glad you guys have chosen to come together. And I want to give a few thoughts on marriage. Let me take a moment Okay, let me take a moment and talk to you. I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about Larsetta. Larsetta is an amazing woman of God. She grew up like this. She did this when she was younger, and then this had happened. She came to, t and everyone, if you came to that wedding and you noticed the whole time I was talking about Larsetta, you say, what's the problem with this pastor? 
We were here for the wedding. We all wanted to celebrate the wedding, but he keeps talking about their mama. Should have been a throwaway. What is pastor doing? Definitely not getting paid after that wedding. See, what does this tell us about the God that we serve? Because really, it's not about Naomi, and it's not about Ruth. It's not about Boaz. It's not about Obed. Who's this chapter 4 about? The Bible is always about God. What does it tell us about the God that we serve? It tells us that God is preoccupied with the welfare and the condition of Naomi. He's he's overwhelmed by it. He can't get his mind off of it. You ever been preoccupied with something? I, I, I never forget me and Joey once, probably every other year or so, we go down to southern Indiana to this um, conference. And this m- maybe was like, I don't know how many years ago. It might have been six, six years ago. And they called me down to be the keynote speaker for the whole weekend. That doesn't usually happen. You know, I'm like a Friday night guy or something. I, I'm not famous enough to get the Saturday night closeout session. So I'm like a Thursday night talk, Friday night session. I'm just saying. But this, they said, we want you to speak once on Friday, twice on Saturday, and once on Sunday. And I'm rolling down with Joey like, yo, son, I'm kind of a big deal. (laughs) Keynote, the whole weekend, whole weekend, I'm kind of a big deal. And so I go out there and I pack my clothes and usually I wear polos when I'm preaching, but I decided to put this sweater vest on, you know, and, and I don't know what happened. It was just the... You ever had like a shirt you didn't iron the front because you knew you were wearing a sweater vest? So you iron the arms and you leave the set. Men know what I'm talking about. You already know what I'm talking about. Some of you all day didn't iron your shirt today. You just put the sweater vest. You all know what I'm talking I'm not even going to talk over here. So I'm out here, and I walk into this sanctuary. I sweat when I walk fast. It had to be 90 degrees in this joker. And I got this sweater on. Joey's there with his, like, nice, loose-fitting shirt. He's like, Thad, how are you doing? So I get up there. I'm already sweating before I get up there to preach. And when I get up there the first night, I'm supposed to set the tone. These people don't know about me from Chicago. Big time speaker. And, and, and the sweat was so bad. There was one fly. And the fly... Have you ever tried to preach with a pool of sweat and one fly? And get this point, and the fly's just landing up, landing up, landing up, down. I, it was the worst sermon I ever gave because I couldn't, I'm just thinking all these people are looking at me and they're sweating the fly. But this is who I am, not a big speaker at all. And then we get into the car and Joey was like, well, I kind of carried you tonight. It was so quiet on the way home. But I could not, and I believed in my mind that the people could not take their eyes off of the fly, and it destroyed everything I was trying to do. But the Bible wants us to know that this little old lady who lost her husband and went through all this tragedy, God is watching her like the fly. He's preoccupied with her situation and her welfare, and he's fixated on her hopes and her dreams. Have you ever taken a moment to think how preoccupied God is with you? We would say, it's done, it's a wedding, move on with the text. And God says, no, I got to talk about one of my people, Naomi. God always keeps coming back because if you're taking notes, God is always preoccupied with the welfare of his people. You, you think you're sneaking into church and going out and doing your thing and God doesn't know I'm just here. If you ever got a glimpse of how preoccupied he is with your heart, you would wake up in the morning and say, he is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of All of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipse. And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affection is for me. Oh, 
how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. You got to make it personal. Oh, how he loves me so. Oh, how he loves me. I would be a bankrupt preacher if you didn't realize. See, a lot of times you think God is preoccupied with my life. Well, that's our pastor. Of course he is. And what I'm telling you is that he can't take his eyes off of you. Every single one of us. He cannot take his, he can't constant, he wants to come back to your welfare. He wants to come back to your situation. God has not forgotten about you. That was a good place to shout. Lorenzo, I thought Lorenzo was going to be filming at that moment. People were going to run down the aisles, shout. Didn't happen like that, Lorenzo. Sorry. That was the moment. It's all downhill from here. The genealogy, and I'm going to close with this thought. And if, Joey, you want to come help me out a little bit. The genealogy ends with a man named David. And all of us have at least heard of David by a show of hands. How many people have at least heard of David? Okay. Second Samuel chapter 7, if you want to read it later or follow along. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself, speaking to David through the prophet Samuel, when your days, the Lord himself will establish a house for you in 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, listen, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, remember Solomon. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He will be my son. When he does wrong, I'll punish him with a rod, yielded, not yielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And listen, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David the revelation. God entered into a covenant with David and speaking of his kingdom, listen. Death will never destroy it. Sin won't stop it. And time will not exhaust it. And through that line of kings, through David, of Davidic kings, my son Jesus will come through that lineage and be the final king of David, the son of David, that will rule and reign forever and ever and ever. See, Ruth is not just a great story, but it's a keynote in the coming of the Son of God. Who knew that the heartache of one woman could have such significance in the kingdom of God? See, that is why we can always live with hope concerning God. How many people have ever suffered in their life? Just look at it. Just, it's okay. How many people have ever suffered? Well, the last point I want to give you on faith is this. Faith is believing God for victory, but also believing, now listen, church, that there is a side to our afflictions that is doing something in the kingdom of God. You guys are like, okay, that, that doesn't preach too well out here. Do you understand that your affliction, look at Naomi, look at Ruth, your affliction can build the kingdom of God. Warren Wearsby, the Christian writer and theologian, was telling of the time where he had a gallbladder trouble. And he went to a Christian doctor named Lloyd uh, Tenney, to have it removed and he said to Dr. Tenney, you know, God gave me a gallbladder and you took it out. Does God make mistakes? And the doctor said, no, no, he doesn't. And Wearsby said, well, if I can live without my gallbladder, then why did God give it to me in the first place? And the surgeon replied, Dr. Tenney replied, he said, God did that so I could send my kids to college. <laughs> I 
What? Who has that perspective? And how could Naomi see 150 years down the timeline and see the kingship of David and hundreds of years later to see the Son of God born in a manger through, in, in, through Mary and in Bethlehem? Who could have seen that? This is what Ruth tells us, that famine and destitution and three people dying and poor people struggling to live and barley and threshing floors and love affairs and court cases and finally the birth of this little baby Obed are all of the ways that God, the normal ways that God tries to establish his kingdom in the earth. And it tells us something else, church that none of us are wise enough to say God does not know what he's doing. Oh, man. None of us are wise enough. One last story. And this is about a pest. A pest, the boll weevil. Anybody heard of the boll weevil? Just Bill, a couple. A bo <laughs> He's lived a long time. He's heard of the boll weevil. Well, this pest was indigenous to Mexico, and but appeared in Alabama in 1915. And by 1918, farmers were losing whole cotton crops to this boll weevil beetle. And this brother named H.M. Sessions saw this as an opportunity to convert the area to peanut farming. And in 1916, he convinced C.W. Baston, a farmer, to back his venture. And the first crop paid off their debts and was bought by farmers seeking to change to peanut farming. And cotton was grown again, but farmers learned to diversify their crops. And this practice brought new money into Coffee County and really changed the whole dynamic of their economic sy system. And this guy, bon, bon, uh, bon Fleming, came up with an idea to build a monument and help to finance the cost. And in Alabama, the Bowl Weevil Monument in Enterprise, Alabama is a landmark and a tribute erected by the citizens of that town in Enterprise to show their appreciation to this pest, this insect, the Bowl Weevil, for its profound influence on the area's agriculture and economy. And, and if you went there, the monument is a woman holding up a football-sized boll weevil beetle in bronze, just holding it up. Who would have thought a pest would save the day? And who would have thought that your circumstances are producing an overwhelming glory in the kingdom of God? Mm. If you've ever had complicated drama in your life, I want you to stand with me. <laughs> some of you all jumped up. It's because you're like, no, I didn't have, I have some drama. Well, faith is realizing that God takes that complicated drama of your life and your ordinary life, and he uses that story to further the kingdom. And I challenge you today, that you would agree with me to look at your circumstances different. That faith would rise up in your heart and you would understand that God is 10 steps ahead of you. If you believe that today, just stretch your hands. Father, I thank you, God, that you are Alpha and Omega. I thank you, God, that the book of Ruth shows us that you've not forgotten about us. And Lord, that even some of the minute, ordinary complicated things that we're going through, God, are working out a far deeper, a far greater weight of glory. So God, we hand our lives over to you. We hand over worry to you. We hand over stress and anxiety, and we trust the almighty hands of God our Father, who is so good and so faithful and so preoccupied with us. God, we give you glory and honor today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church.